Hello, friends. Welcome to No Cap Room. My name is Jake Fisher. I'm a senior NBA reporter at Yahoo Sports. And I'm joined by my man, your man, everyone's man, Dan Devine, here on the Ball Don't Lie podcast. What is up, my guy? I mean, everything, Jake, everything. We are starting this new adventure together. I have a dog sleeping behind me who's going to be a good boy and stay quiet throughout this entire recording. We're going to have an exciting time. I can't wait to get to it. Let's kick it off. Let's kick it off with our first episode of No Cap Room. We'll talk about Michael Jordan, some bachelor parties, and the Chicago Bulls. I promise those things are not related. (laughs) Um, But first, since it's episode one, let's tell you guys a little bit about what you can expect from us here on No Cap Room. I believe we're coming out every Thursday, if I have that wrong. Uh, John Gennaro behind the glass, let me know. Uh, (laughs) Vinny Goodwill with good word with goodwill be out on Mondays on the other uh, ball. Don't lie podcast program, but here, no cap room. Look, it's a play on words. There's a lot of NBA podcasts out there with two (laughs) white men starring on it. There aren't many titles left, but like we will be backing up the headline here. Um, You know, it's, it's a state of being, there's no bullshit. We got unfettered truth only. We're going to have some interviews. We're going to have some stupid games, some weird conversations. I think if you stick around, uh, you'll get the hang of it. Um, And before, I'm I'm going to go against the quick rundown here. Dan, any other quick little teasers, insights to kind of let our audience know what we're going to be bringing here on a weekly basis? Well, I think the first thing to note is that I pitched fettered truths and Jake smacked me across the face. It was it was really rude, I I thought, and pretty uncalled for because we didn't know one another very well at that point. He said, no, only unfettered truths, divine. Now get back in your box. And then I got back in my box and uh, that we waited until today. But uh, yeah, the idea is let's focus on as much as we can the things about this that are fun and silly and ridiculous. And we'll try to learn something along the way. But if we if we can make you laugh or learn something new about the NBA or both, then we're doing our job and we're having the show that we want to have. That's the general idea. There you go. We've got the homework kid, Dan Devine. <laughs> I, ha- I am accepting the nickname, the People's Insider, but I am not going to perpetuate it ever again. That is the last time you'll hear me say that. It is not gonna- the last time you'll hear it on the show, though, because I guarantee you I'm going to come back with that. I would love for you to call me that. I just don't want, <laughs> you know, we had a whole nickname thing last time and I don't want to put that on myself, <laughs> but we're going to try to have a fusion in the middle and bring some, uh, what we believe in throwing conversation, which we will start here with our first little news segment, which is not little, it could be potentially pretty, mm. uh, have some l- large ramifications in the Western conference playoff picture where, Paul George suffered a nasty leg injury last night. We're recording this on Wednesday um, in the Clippers 101-100 loss to the Oklahoma City Thunder, which now ESPN is reporting is a sprained right knee that will have George out for at least the rest of the regular season. It'll be reevaluated in two, three weeks. The Clippers had won five of their last six heading into this game. They seem to have surged kind of out of the play-in picture altogether. We'll talk about the TM play-in push later in the show. Um, But for now, I mean, Dan, you scrupulously watch this league as well as anyone, as attentively as anyone. Where does this kind of leave you feeling about the Clippers moving forward here? Well, they're pro- I mean, they're still in a position that's going to, you know, land them in the in the the postseason in all likelihood, right? They're a game out of fourth place in the West, but they're two and a half games clear of the play-in. So like, of being of eleventh place, meaning like being out of the play-in. So we're still likely to see some some nature of postseason play for them. Uh, th- as long as they have Kawhi Leonard, they still have a shot in any kind of postseason that they wind up in. But this is kind of always the thing with them, and it's been the thing for four years since they brought this this tandem together. At some point, you need to see the whole team for a whole season for it to feel real, right? Or to to have any any consistent confidence in it. Granted, it's not you know through nobody's fault that Kawhi Leonard uh, tore his ACL during the postseason a couple of years back. Like it felt like we were finally seeing the realized version of the Clippers at that point. But since that point, we have not. And and even this season, you know, I, I continue to see really smart people who are super plugged into the league and uh, evaluate things using metrics and and eye tests and everything that I consider to be pretty smart and reasonable say, I think the Clippers are going to win it all. Uh, I think they still are, are a, a, a dark horse to win it all, even as they were mediocre for 70 games or whatever. 
And I understand why the whole the whole thing hinges on when they have Kawhi Leonard and Paul George on the floor. They're awesome. And that bore out this season or to, to this point in the regular season. We'll see if you know when we get Paul George back uh, in games that matter. But they were plus 173 in 995 minutes with them. Outscored opponents by 8.3 points per 100 possessions. Scored like the league's best offense. Clamped down like a top five defense with those guys on the floor. The most important number of all those numbers, though, 995 minutes. That's like a quarter of the Clippers' whole season. And they've been outscored whenever one of them played without the other. They got drilled when neither one of them were on the floor. And you only get the team that you hoped to have for like a quarter of the season. And now you head into the most important part of the season and you're not going to have it. Kawhi Leonard can win you a playoff game. He can win you a playoff series. We've seen him do that in the past. But everyone has sort of talked about this being the season where everything had to come together for the Clippers. And it seems like yet again, it's not going to. It, it, it had to come together, you know, that that notion um, in the sense that this is the fourth year of it. They came together. People may recall pretty much the same exact night, day, whatever you want, whatever it was, that exact chronology of Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving choosing to join forces in Brooklyn. That, you know, juggernaut on the other side of the aisle obviously has crumbled and those two guys are no longer there. There's been rumblings, you know, since the kind of surprising Western Conference Finals run that the Clippers made um, without uh, Kawhi Leonard, with Paul George and Reggie Jackson masquerading as Robin to Batman there. <laughs> and the thought is certainly out there around the league that, Steve Ballmer's patience could potentially be waning on whatever this, you know, regime, organizational structure, even the building blocks of Kawhi and Paul George together, being that they've got this new arena in, you know, progress here. They had some thing where he shot a free throw on the dirt floor to be the first bucket. Maybe it was, <laughs> a, you know, a basketball version of groundbreaking. I don't know. I think I missed that in the context of him just screaming about toilets for what felt like toilets. about an hour. Toilets, a... toilets. <laughs> Listen, oh, good. I... It's our first episode. We already have our first drop. That's fantastic. Listen, as a man with IBS, I'm just going to throw it out there. <laughs> toilets are important. <laughs> oh, very important. good. Very think good about it every time I go to an NBA arena. I really do. <laughs> well, it's important. You got to you got to know your exits. You got to have your strategy in place. You really do. Um, but to bring it back to the uh, arm, Chuck, as I hit my microphone, sourcing of this <laughs> all, I mean, there's been just at this, this is the time of year where executives and coaches are looking around at potential landing spots for themselves, for their friends who could hire them uh, for, you know, go down the line. And the Clippers are a team that is at least one that looks like it has a question mark of who will be comprising this you know, chance to compete for a title if that is still the goal, which it seems like it will be moving forward next season, whether that's in the front office, Ty Lue, um, as as respected a head coach as they come, but there's been uh, chatter, let's say, about potentially him, in theory, removing himself from the situation at a certain mm -hmm. point in time. Um, so there's a lot, I think, at stake Um on the other side of LA where the Lakers get all the attention and LeBron's, you know, quest for a fifth ring is always soaking up the headlines. The Clippers could end up becoming a super buzzy team in the postseason. But again, that, that could be a situation for a lot of organizations. There's so many teams in the NBA that have high, high, high expectations this season. And only four of them are going to be able to make the conference finals, which could lead to just changes and, who knows? We're going to wait and see. That's why they play the games. And um, one of those teams, I think, that people are, are certainly circling as a potential, you know, who, what could happen depending on how the postseason luck is in Philadelphia, where, you know, the James Harden Houston rumors haven't gone away, of course. And Dan, I know you've been taking a look at Philly's title, you know, chances being that before a loss, a very curious double overtime loss, uh, the Chicago being that low scoring game, weird game, Patrick Beverly game. We're going to talk about that later. The Sixers had won eight straight games. I believe they had briefly uh, surmounted Boston for the number two seed in the East. There was some talk about, could they go and get Milwaukee for the one seed? Uh, they, I believe are currently winning their regular season series against Milwaukee. 
the Embiid Harden two get two man game had quietly morphed into this juggernaut, and no one was really talking about that much. What would you like to do to start that conversation a little bit louder? Well, I think the the big thing is as much everybody has focused on the Embiid component of it, and understandably so. Guys leading the league in scoring. There's obviously the broader uh, MVP conversation surrounding him, and we can get into that or not get into that, which would obviously be fine by me at this point, given the tenor of that conversation. But um, as much as we've sort of spoken about what Embiid's, the way he's shifted his game and the way he's advanced his game by going from like a low post back you down mauler to somebody who's at the free throw line, posting up at the nail, kind of like Dirk Nowitzki late in his career and facing up and, and doing that. The reason that is sort of, or Harden's arrival and that their growth together has really allowed that to happen because it's pick, high pick and roll, get him down that short roll to the nail, and then you can kind of flow out of that. And so much of their offense now, Tyrese Maxey on the weak side, they have their you know, shooters in the corners, PJ Tucker and Tobias Harris. And there's just, there's so many options that you can go to out of that. And Harden really does unlock that. It's sort of easy to forget given how many uh, how much Embiid scoring that Harden's also leading the league in assists while averaging 20 himself. And the the numbers on it are just nuts uh, on the, the, the two-man game. I know we've, we've talked a little bit about that. Well, overall, the Sixers have the best record in the NBA since the start of December. And I feel like that, you mentioned it kind of quietly happened because there's been, there was so much focus on other teams making hot runs and they were just sort of consistently climbing up that hill. Um, and their offense is the big reason why they're the number one offense in the league. And that's been ahead even of, you know, Sacramento, Denver, everybody else. Harden and Embiid and the Harden and Embiid pick and roll is the 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 heartbeat of that. And the way the fact that when Harden's on the floor Embiid becomes a finisher more than a creator, he doesn't have to do everything as much. We know he can, but that's always been that fear, that question, right? If you are in a big game late in the season or in the postseason and it's the fourth quarter, can you just throw the ball into the post for your big man to create in 2022, in 2023? And it's, it's just such an uphill battle with the two-man game there. You don't have to. And I think that's what gives you so much more uh, optimism about what can happen for them in a postseason series, provided, uh, you know, the ghosts of postseasons past don't jump up and bite the Sixers in a lot of different directions. The thing about their two main game that I want to call out is this. I don't remember if it was the end of regulation or the end of overtime in that Chicago game. But whenever there was like six seconds left, the ball, Tyrus Maxey had the ball on the left wing and Beeb was kind of floating around the elbow. He pointed at Maxey to swing it over to Harden. Instead of parking his ass on the block and demanding the ball, which is what he would have done in years past. And what mm-hmm. I believe he even did in the postseason last year when Harden was with playing with one hamstring. So there was a lot to be said at the time. Or people had a lot to say at the time in Philly from Harden's old Houston days, coaches who had been with Embiid, that particularly those two guys running pick and roll was not exactly a hand and glove fit that Embiid is not, you know, your Clint Capella, you know, even the later stage Dwight Howard, just sure. pogo stick lob threat. He wants his touches. The fact that they've found that rhythm and that's the play that Embiid himself is calling for in the heat of the right. final seconds, I thought was a telling little moment for whatever this team's chances are in the Eastern conference. I mean, what, what do you think is, the recipe that any potential challenger has to to combat that uh, that pairing there. Well, yeah, I think a lot of it's going to come back to who are the initial defenders in that action, right? So, if you're a say Milwaukee and you can guard that action with Drew Holiday and Giannis, or even I guess Drew Holiday and Brook Lopez, because he's been you know more spry switching out onto the perimeter, but. Obviously, Drew Holiday is given up about a foot and a half to Joel Embiid or, you know, like it's, it's that is a, a mismatch size wise. But if you could feel good about what you might be able to do in space or with, you know, slapping down on the ball or whatever, and you're not going to give Harden an easy driving lane because you have a, a size and athleticism advantage there. So you wonder, I mean, switching, that's going to be untenable because of what Embiid can do. But if you can stall Harden out, that's that's, I think, job one. Weak side help is a big part of that. 
I mean, that's why Maxi is such a huge component to this. Like if you there were there was a play in, earlier in that game or it might have been against Cleveland uh, la, uh, last Wednesday where you see the it was, uh, it was Darius. It was against Cleveland. It was Darius Garland. He's guarding Maxi on the weak side. He kind of cheats all over because he knows that Embiid's going to get the ball at the nail. And as soon as he does that, Harden flings a cross court pass right to Maxi's shooting pocket. Maxi is driving before he even has the ball in his hands, and it's uh, you know penetrating it and, and uh, compromising the defense. And so there's like all these other ways that they can hurt you with it. But smart weak side help early is going to be an, imp- an important part of that. The big things, though, I mean, the questions that everybody's had about the Sixers are going to have always been about a what happens when Embiid's off the floor. And it has been a graveyard of backup centers past uh, a haunted house for the Sixers over the years. And now we find out if uh, Paul Reed, shout out to B-Ball Paul and Dwayne Dedman, Montrez Harrell or the P.J. Tucker at center lineups can keep Philly afloat during that time. A lot of it obviously is going to depend on what Harden does in those minutes because he's going to be expected to carry those lineups offensively. Uh, Can they score enough? They've had some success when it's they do go small and it's Tucker and Niang and, you know, Shake Milton or whoever with Maxi out there enough shooting. If you if you hit enough shots in those minutes, can you stay afloat? I think teams are going to say we know we're going to sell out, sell out on and beat and make other people beat us. This is why Harden's there. And this is the that's the ghost he's got to exercise, the demons that he's got to overcome. And, you know, we'll 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 see what the, what that turns out to be. But they've done just about everything they can do outside of transition defense. They got to tighten that up broadly, but they've done pretty much everything they can do to put themselves in a position where you feel confident in what they bring to the table uh, in a late game situation. It's just going to be about whether, you know, the the guy who's got the ball in his hands is able to execute in that spot, which we've had a, a, a lot of a lot of uh, we've seen that movie before. When Harden got to Brooklyn, he dubbed it "scary hours." With all your ghosts and haunted house <laughs> imagery, I'm I'm officially dubbing this playoff run "spooky season" for Philly. <laughs> and, Can and they and overcome listen, the spook. It's not always it's not always scary in the way that Harden intended. That's uh, so definitely the way the way things worked out in Brooklyn did not go that way. The way the end of last season worked out for Philly did not work out that way. If the playoff bracket works out to where you wind up getting like I don't know. Miami in round one this year, that would not be uh, a particularly exciting option for Philly. I, there's just, there's a lot of things that can go against them, but the way that they've functioned offensively for three months now, three and a, you know, more than that has to make you feel confident uh, or I guess as confident as a Sixers fan is going to be able to feel. I want to touch on another two man game. That's been super efficient of late. The team has not been nearly as successful. The Minnesota Timberwolves reuniting Mike Conley and Rudy Gobert after the three-team trade with the Lakers and the Jazz back in February. Um, I spent some time with both Conley and Gobert on Monday when the Wolves were here at Madison Square Garden. Kind of like a little buddy cop feature I'm working on. I don't want to say too, too much, but what I'll say is that um, in my reporting conversations, and it's definitely evidenced by the numbers, um, I mean, the Jazz clearly thrived when they put Conley and Gobert together against second units and that lineup absolutely feasted on opponents as the Jazz became a contender in the West. And when I was talking to Wolves people about how could they do that and recreate that in Minneapolis and even Gobert himself told me when I was talking about that, he said to me straight up, he said, tell Finch that. Tell Finch we like to do (laughs) second unit stuff. Well, you need Carl Anthony Towns, really, in order to make that happen. And the good news is he's back. The bad news is, obviously, we're still waiting to find out when exactly Anthony Edwards' ankle injury uh, will be okay. Um, But, I mean, it's kind of just evidentiary of the terrible, you know, tumultuous time Minnesota's had with injury luck this season, where the second cat comes back, or even before that, like, Ant's not in the picture. But that being said, like, bringing in this weapon when Ant is on you know, being sidelined after becoming an all-star pretty, pretty handy return timing. So, I mean, that's one thing I'm looking to see how they will be able to stagger cat and the Rudy Conley minutes. Um, but before Ant got hurt, this team was kind of lurking as like a potential real, no one wants to see this team in the first round type of, you know, playoff threat. Um, what say you about Minnesota with Cat coming back into the fold in the context of this new big little man pairing that's actually an old big little man pairing? 
<laughs> yeah, I, I think the biggest questions about how he'll fit are the ones that also plagued them throughout the first 21 games before he got hurt, right? It was, how do you get, the the the, the entire premise of the Wolves team was, we need to graft a an elite defense onto what was an elite offense last year. So you go get like the all-in-one box elite defense in Rudy Gobert, and then it just, it didn't click and in exactly the way that everybody was worried it wouldn't click where they couldn't score quite right when it had when Cat and Gobert were on the floor together. They couldn't stop anybody when Cat was the only big. They couldn't score when Gobert was the only big. And they just it enough. And, you know, Ant was talking about having a cluttered lane. And the reason why he wasn't dunking was because there was always four people in front of him. Like there was always it just it never felt comfortable. They found an equilibrium with Cat out and that the reestablished pecking order involved Anthony Edwards becoming an all-star and the unquestioned number one offensive option there. It included Gobert getting, you know, his, his running buddy and Conley back and also establishing some, just some comfort guys starting to pass to him a little bit more also helped. Um, and Jaden McDaniels becoming a significantly bigger part of the, the, the plan on both ends, but the offense has still been an issue. They're a bottom 10 offense all year, even with Ant being, a uh, an all star score and one of the best one on one players in the league, and so that's really where the, the the towns component comes in. And you say, well, is it possible for him to be? I don't know when he's coming on on limited minutes and just you know, getting back into the flow after missing, you know, since the end of November. Is he maybe your second unit guy? Is he somebody that you come in and you have him off the bench? As you to your point, does that get in the way of letting Conley and Gobert attack more reserve reserve groups? Uh, if you're staggering, it, it it presents a lot of logistical puzzles to kind of solve and rotational shuffles to figure out with what nine, 10 games left in the season with Ant also being out. So, I mean, I think the, the, the optimists take the glass half full notion is if you were a bad offensive team overall and a really bad offensive team, whenever Ant was off the floor, good news, you just brought an all NBA offensive player back into your lineup. The glass half empty take is you had all those guys for 20 games before and you have no, and it didn't work. It was it was looking ragged at that point. And then you spent three months not getting to see more of it. So at what point do you feel confident that it's going to work out now? Um, I think at this point, the Wolves are who they are and their team is going to have to hang their hat on the defense. They give up uh, 109.7 points per hundred when they've got Ant, Jaden McDaniels and Gobert on the floor. That's an elite number. That's like best in the league defense. The, the offense is rough, but they're going to have to just that's going to be their recipe right now. And the hope is that Cap becomes an X factor enough in whatever minutes he gives to bump that, you know, that that offensive efficiency up a little bit to make them dangerous. But I, I think the 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 whole experiment, the goal of let's take six months and figure out how all these pieces fit together. They're not going to get that. So now it's like, you know making something in the chopped kitchen and you got 15 minutes to make an appetizer. I don't know how it's all going to taste, but we got to throw everything on the plate. That's kind of where they're left right now. And they take c- c- continue your metaphor here. Like it needs to taste good enough to make the play in man. Like mm-hmm. they only have a half game lead over the Lakers and the Pelicans who are both out right now. The thunder and the jazz at seven and 10 right now, they're not going anywhere. I mean, Dallas, Minnesota, golden state, like, there's a chance all those, even the Clippers, I mean, they're only two and a half games up on the 11 seed Lakers. There's just, mm-hmm. there's going to be a couple teams that miss out. And the ramifications will be, to go back to what we were saying at the top of this whole episode, the ramifications will be fascinating to see what happens out of that fallout. Um, we'll talk about the other side of the play-in tournament in the East after the break. We'll talk about Michael Jordan and Charlotte Hornets after the break. Uh, but stick around. This is the debut episode of No Cap Room on Ball Don't Lie podcast. Welcome back to No Cap Room. I'm Jake Fisher alongside Dan Devine, which you know because you just have been listening to us, but that's what (laughs) we're doing here. The other big news of the week, I think, aside from Paul George's injury... Uh, I guess this was even from last week, um, was reporting from ESPN that Michael Jordan is in serious talks uh, to sell the franchise to minority owner Glade Plotkin and others. Um, This has been something that has been ruminating and has been 
something that people within the Hornets facility have been talking about for several years now. Um, and the grander picture is way larger. Um, we'll get into him being the only black owner of an NBA franchise. We'll get into the, the thought of losing someone like Michael Jordan being tied to this game. Um, but first, I kind of just want to get into a little bit of what I've learned as to, to why he is selling. Because I think that's the big question here um, for a lot of people. Because the news kind of did seem to take people in NBA corners by surprise. Although this has been kind of a, an open secret, I think, for a while now, dating back to the fall, where the word was a, really consistently that this was something that was probably going to be more tied with the new TV contract um, and that the league would, in theory, benefit from there being maybe a changing of the guard where we all know Le- of LeBron's intentions to own a team one day. I mean, the guy literally called out Adam Silver during a preseason media availability in Las Vegas and said, I want the team in Las Vegas. <laughs> right. So I don't think we are ruffling any feathers by putting that out. Um and it would just be a nice, you know, kitschy story to have MJ walking into the sunset of his NBA ownership as LeBron, you know, the new all-time scoring leader. His argument for the GOAT, you know, takes his reins of, of a club. Um, but I think the thing I'm most interested to see LeBron as an owner is in, in contrast to one, you know, pretty consistent characteristic I've heard from Charlotte people over the years is about about how MJ has conducted himself as an owner, both behind the scenes and in public where like this guy ain't Mark Cuban. Like you don't see MJ courtside. Sure. Pumping his chest out to the point where I've actually been told from, from numerous former and present Hornets folks that like the joy of owning a team has kind of been sapped for Jordan. And that he he feels like it's maybe even a bit of a distraction for someone of his magnitude to be sitting courtside like a Cuban or a Balmer, which I think probably if you know is a bit of a miscalculation. Like if you're always there, then like oh Michael Jordan's always at our our local bar rather than Michael Jordan walks into your bar and it's like holy shit, Michael Jordan's here. <laughs> um, but I think the other real aspect of this story is that Michael Jordan is everything that he has not been as a Charlotte Hornets owner is apparently that as a NASCAR owner and by various accounts investing quite a bit of money in the 2311 racing company that uh, he has co-founded where they've sign the biggest racer in the sport in terms of popularity if i have that off in terms of popularity i apologize but bubba wallace at least anecdotally seems to be the you know the modern day face of the sport so there's you know a laundry list of things that happen on the basketball operations side you know most notably i think the turning down of four first round picks from the boston celtics in I believe Ooh. the 2015 draft, uh, where they ended up taking one Frank Kaminsky um, <laughs> instead of allowing did, Danny. Did Ainge that not to... work out? Did that did that not go quite the way they'd hoped? It did not. It did not. Um, and I don't know. Just to kind of wrap up this little monologue, like it is interesting also with all the talk about the TV deal being a parameter for when this could happen, and the fact that Charlotte is. They're not the best positioned team, but they are certainly well positioned to have a chance at landing Victor Wembanyama. Um, I mean, there's just other great contexts where obviously the numbers of sales right now are, are just through to the roof. Or you know, Phoenix is valued at four billion dollars, and you know the Bucks just changed hands, and you know Portland is going to be another team that we can touch on later. Um, but I'm, I'm just curious for you, Dan. How would you want to characterize the tenure of Jordan running this organization if it ended, you know, today in theory? Um, I'm curious what you think this just means in general for for the NBA at large. Well, yeah, it's a the idea of Michael Jordan not being associated with the NBA in a direct capacity anymore is that's a big 
bummer. That's a problem. Uh, is it, you know, your mileage may vary as to whether you think he's the greatest player of all time. I think in terms of the evolution and the growth of the sport and uh, the, the explosion of the NBA as a business over the last 30 odd years, I mean, he, I think you can make a pretty strong argument that he's the most important player in the history of the league. Um, there is, you know, cross cultural components to, you know, you could argue that Bill Russell is, you could argue that, you know, Elgin Baylor is sort of the forgotten member in a lot of that conversation where it's like, he got kind of got the Lakers to from Minneapolis to LA and sort of was the first modern player that looked like that and could elevate and, you know, the interior of the aerial game, um, obviously burden and magic for what they did to kind of transition the league, uh, in the seventies into the eighties and the way that sort of exploded things. But Michael Jordan is freaking Michael Jordan, you know, and the idea that he it mattered that he it has mattered that he owns a team, even if that team itself has rarely mattered. Um, you know, you mentioned he might not feel very much joy. And I think when you look at two, I think two playoff runs in the entirety of his tenure uh, and both of them ending in the first round, they never won 50 games. They have yet to win 50 games in his tenure. There's a lot. You can certainly understand why. It's not a particularly joyful uh, experience. I, I think the thing that I keep th coming back to is if you're a Charlotte Hornets fan, I guess the hope, the optimistic here of you here is if leadership changes and ownership changes and an approach to doing business changes, then maybe that means fresh sets of ideas and how we approach stuff like player evaluation, draft and develop, um, you know, the way we uh, think about, you know, I mean, I've, I have a ton of respect for Steve Clifford, so I don't mean this as a, as a diminishing, a diminishment of him, but, you know, thinking about instead of like bringing back somebody that we had before new ideas and a coaching staff, right? New ideas in terms of how we, uh, construct rosters and w where we place our value. The, uh, the impression I've always gotten that I've heard from people that have paid closer attention there and stuff like that is that because of the way Jordan does business, a lot of it is sort of a friends and family operation. You know, yes. you wind up with people that he knows that he trusts, um, you know, it's why Buzz Peterson, his college roommate, becomes an assistant GM there. It's why fellow Tar Heel uh, Mitch Kupchak becomes the GM there. Uh, it's the, the on and on down the list, right? And that's not to say that don't, any of those decisions were bad on their face or that they they didn't pan out in the way that you'd hope. It's just there is a question of are, are you kind of maximizing what you can make that franchise into? Um, and I think it's not a question. The, you you just you said it earlier. They have. It's, uh, the, the success on court certainly has not been commensurate with it. Right. And so the, 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 you look at it and say, if there's going to be a fresh level of investment. And also, by the way, when the question is, why is Michael Jordan, might he be looking to sell now? Uh, this context maybe matters a bit too. In 2010, he paid $275 million to become the majority owner of the franchise. And as of October, 2022, the valuation was 1.7 billion. And we have seen that most of the time franchises go for more than those Forbes valuations, right? Like that's kind of a low number. So he might be able to kind of like 10 X an investment in a team that has not been good for almost the entire time he's had it, which is, you know, maybe he would be able to do even better uh, if you waited until the new TV deal kicked in, but that's not, uh, it's still pretty nice work if you can get it. But the hope I think would have to be you get this high lottery pick, whatever it winds up being, you have LaMelo ball already in, in place. If you bring in people who are willing to pump money into the franchise, who are willing to sort of take a big swing approach as new owners often seem to be able to do to put their uh, stamp on the franchise, maybe that coincides with an opportunity to, I mean, we an, an opportunity to develop a core that we kind of haven't seen in Charlotte in quite a long time. You know, the best chances that they've had over the last decade and a half involved Kemba Walker and Al Jefferson, right? And those were fun teams and they they had, but they had a very sort of defined ceiling. You pair somebody like, if the ping pong balls bounce your way, Victor Wembanyama with LaMelo Ball, um, I don't know that there is a ceiling for that. You talked about valuations. That, that's a new key development here, I think, in the ownership world where we saw it with Phoenix, where I'm not going to get the percentages right off the top of my head. Um, but to get the ownership stake, the the actual majority partnership uh, for Matt Ishbia from Robert Sarver, where you get that valuation at you know billions and billions of dollars, you only have to pay, and I, I'm saying only in relative terms, <laughs> right, right. You only have to pay a billion dollars to get you know light work, thirty three percent, nice and easy, in order to get the control stake if you're. 
you know, someone who already has 30% of a team, like in this situation with Charlotte, to make that valuation all of a sudden be, you know, snap your fingers. They got a $3 billion entity here. And there's so much private equity money that is just wanting and itching and kind of drooling on the sidelines to get into this NBA ownership club. Because I think, number one, live sports, for whatever reason, I am seeing this uh, audience numbers be skewed and confused. And we who knows if viewership's going up or down in today's uh, streaming era. But people want that, that live TV uh, advertising revenue. Um, yeah, captive eyeballs on something that people can't just watch later. And owning an arena now has become, I mean, the Warriors have set such a gold standard mm. with Chase Center where you can have a hotel and restaurants and you have your, I mean, Madison Square Garden is dark two nights a year. Like, if you have... And that's just when they're going to update the facial recognition technology, right? <laughs> they got to keep everybody out of there just to tweet, uh, update the algorithm. Uh, that's you saying that, not me. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to remain a member of the press corps that goes to Madison Square Garden games. <laughs> All that to be said, it'll, it'll be curious to see how quickly this sale process goes and what that final number is. Because we do know that the Trailblazers are, are next in line at some point in time. They might not be the very next one, but... Uh, after the passing of Paul Allen, like his estate is being, I mean, Adam Silver said this at press, you know, gatherings in the last year. Um, I mean, th they're not going to, that team is just going to change hands at some point in time from Jody Allen to another person or an entity. Um, there can be other things. There can be other teams down the pipeline as well. And I'm expecting that I mean this is going to be a continued trend, I think, for the foreseeable future here as the TV deal gets kicked in, as a new CBA gets ratified. We saw Milwaukee um change it a little bit um with some of the majority situations there. So it just is something I think NBA fans should be kind of preparing themselves for that the transaction game of this league is not just gonna be players and coaches and executives. Um I think we're going to see a lot of, you know, even minority stakes that people don't necessarily care too, too much about because you're so only so far away from being a guy with a voice in the room or a gal with a voice in the room and having your son's favorite player on your roster. Like that's just how the NBA works. And I think it's a, it's as enticing a proposition as ever before. Um, One sec before you do that, yeah. I just want to say like, the, the you, if you're talking about a billion dollars, like being table stakes to get a controlling share of a team, right? This is why then, I mean, that is a, like we, because we are talking about millions and billions of dollars with some regularity in the world of professional sports, we can kind of speed past that number. That's nuts. That's a crazy amount of money. Right. And that is why you're seeing stuff like in December, I believe it was, I forget if it was Mike Varkanov at the athletic or whoever was who reported it first, but that the NBA is now like going to become open to sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, courting investment from these other sources too, not just private equity, like, you know, like in the, in the way that European soccer has, has sort of opened the door to these sorts of things too, where you could have, you know, like a Saudi national or Saudi sovereign wealth fund or something like that, like where PSG in, uh, in, uh, France's league one is like, uh, a, a subsidized team from, uh, a national wealth fund. Like there are, there could be a whole new world in terms of what money comes into the league, who's in and who are ha who's having those sort of controlling stakes and what kind of decisions they want to make as a result of it. So there's the idea that the I mean, when the Hornets can be a several billion dollar franchise, we are playing a very, very different game, broadly speaking, than we have ever seen in the history of this league. And it will be kind of fascinating to find out what that means for the way things change. Let's transition to the other franchise most, I mean, the chan the franchise most affiliated with Michael Jordan, the Chicago Bulls, which he is not uh, professionally affiliated with at this juncture. I can't say that word, affiliated. There you go. Sorry, but they, they, have a, they still have a statue of him outside the, of outside the gym. So he's, he's still very much part of the situation. He is. And uh, we're calling this segment a little vibe check. Um, where we're just going to, you know, ramble, 
talk, chat, <laughs> catch up about a team. And the team that I want to talk about right now, the Chicago Bulls, playing sneaky good, six and four in their last ten. Start three the parade game. down the Miracle Mile. They're six and four in their last ten. Three game win streak, including double overtime against Philadelphia. They are currently in position to be in the play in, which we are trademarking as the play in push. There's playoff pushes. <laughs> no one said it. The play in push, where a hapless franchise claws through everything in their path to make it to a single elimination game on the road. Chicago's doing it. They're eight and four with Patrick Beverly since the trade deadline. They're the best defense in the league since February 24th. Maybe because Patrick Beverly doesn't have sex before games, <laughs> according to his podcast. Okay. That's my intro. I'm hyped All right. about the Bulls. I'm hyped about the Bulls, Dan. I mean, that's fine. I'm not here to uh, you know, to to kink shame you or yuck your yum as far as how into the Bulls you get. That's between you and your God, I'm not here to argue about that. Um, I am. I don't know that I, I. I. I did see the story about Patrick Beverly not having sex the night before games. Here's the official quote, as transcribed from his podcast by TalkBasket.net. I don't have sex the night before games. Beverly said before his co-host mentioned keeping his legs fresh. I want to have fresh. You know what I'm saying? Wifey gonna kill me though. And uh, I do. I mean. I appreciate that. Uh, our producer, John Gennaro, had to mention that sounded like it came from from Rocky. I, I believe Mickey did say that, you know, that women uh, women kill legs. Uh, you know, Patrick Beverly has certainly seemed to have fresh legs. Uh, so, I mean, I guess don't don't mess with the winning streak, even if that winning streak is three games long and six and four in your last 10. I mean, the Wizards have done everything they can to just gift wrap the 10 seed to Chicago. They're two and eight in their last 10. So. I mean, I guess congratulations to the wizards on all the sex. That's the only thing you can kind of come away from it feeling <laughs> like the, the only explanation for why everything's gone so badly for them. Uh, my, my, my deepest esteem to them. You're, you're right to know the defense is the thing that has sort of turned the bulls around. The thing I would have the caveat I would have there is it's true. Like they've been ter forcing turnovers with, Beverly and Alex Caruso on the floor. That's become a big part. Of, it was it was th that was the big part of why their defense was any good last year. When before all the injuries set in, and you had Lonzo and uh, and Pat and Alex Caruso at the the point of attack, they were just like pressuring ball handlers, forcing turnovers, getting out in transition. That was kind of changing everything. And when they didn't have that, it became really really hard for them to get stops because otherwise you were just if you weren't forcing turnovers up top stopping the ball at the point of attack, you were letting people have a runway right at Nick Vucevic, who for all the wonderful things that he does on the offensive end is, and as a rebounder is not a rim protector, right? So you get Beverly to re, you know bring back some of that uh, aggressiveness at the point of attack. You get Caruso back healthy, who's been an absolute demon, you know, deflecting balls, stealing, you know, getting steals, all those sorts of things, guarding seven footers on switches, like, you know, uh, little white headbanded Marcus Smart, and the uh, you, they just got Javante Green back, which is another sort of athletic uh, front court player. A Derek Jones Jr. favorite Javante Green. The coaches, there you go. Love Javante Green in Chicago. I can confidently tell you that. There you go. And and I mean, and well, guys who just sort of dunk on offense and then play defense like their hair's on fire. People tend to like those dudes. They you know, they're you don't necessarily see uh, a whole. Uh, there's not as many of those to go around as you might think. So there's there's stuff there defensively. The thing I would caution everybody about before you get we get too far afield in uh, loving the vibes of the Bulls defense is that so they're giving up three pointers more often than any team in the league during this span where they've had the best defense. More than 41 percent of opponents shots are coming from beyond the arc. They're shooting 36 percent, which is like below league average uh, offensive or below league average shooting. That's the 10th lowest uh, percentage in the league in that span. If you get some regression in those shots going down then the 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 numbers of the, the defensive efficiency numbers are going to start uh, taking on water. Maybe this is not like, the, you know, the, the, I think it was Seth Part now with the, uh, the formerly with the Bucks, then with the Athletic, we call it Jedi defense, right? The idea like you're, uh, you're giving up shots, but to the right shooters. So it doesn't hurt you quite as much. Maybe there's something to that. Maybe the closeouts are, are particularly great when you've got the, the guys like Pat Bev and Caruso and Green and Derek Jones Jr. and whoever else on the perimeter. And maybe the those three point numbers hold up, but uh, if you're relying heavy minutes on Vooch, on Demar Derozan, and on Zach Levine as they are going to be, because those are their three best offensive players, 
it's still going to be really tough to get stops in a postseason context. So the vibes are definitely better than they were. I'm just into saying the- to make the postseason. I'm just saying. Yeah, actually getting get there is something. To a right. single elimination situation. A single elimination situation. See, you crushed that affiliate you had a problem with earlier, but that one That's knocked it out of one. the park. And Damar, mid-range god, Zach Levine playing just out of his mind right now. Vooch was a little up and under, herky jerkies in the paint. I'm just saying. I, and and does Pat have also avoid the up and under herky jerkies the night before a game? Yeah, I think so. Okay. The other thing too is that I mean the playoffs have always been this team's goal. Obviously, you don't pay out what they paid for Vucevic in terms of draft capital and Wendell Carter Jr. and contracts for Demar and Lonzo to um, to not try to make the playoffs. And curiously, even with this being a season from hell in terms of Lonzo's knee situation, which We've learned he will be undergoing another surgery, cartilage replacement in that knee, which doesn't have a great track record for return. I was going to um, say, did you even know you could replace knee cartilage? Like, what my first thought when I saw that report was like, oh, I did not know you could do that. I only did because way back in the day, when Andrew Bynum's knees were preventing him from going to fill out the 76ers, not only did they try to replace it, they tried to regrow his cartilage in a Petri dish. You can read more of that in a book titled Built to Lose by one of these co-hosts. Um, Probably not the and, one who didn't know you could do that. It was Jake's book, everybody. Let's, let's, no spoilers. It's Jake's book. That's like the one time I'll ever mention the book on here. I promised Stop. anybody. Stop. We're going to talk about it constantly. We're going to vibe Never. check your book. Listen, it came out two years ago. It didn't do all that well. Let's be honest. People We're liked it, but the check is saying numbers. a different story. Um <laughs> I just think that it would be an interesting coda to all this mess where Chicago went from being the team that everyone thought was going to sell, 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 and Zach Levine to the Lakers, and DeMar DeRozan here, and Nuke Vucevic there. And they're, I believe, if not the only team, one of two, but of all this activity at the deadline, they did zilch. They started telling teams that if you want Andre Drummond, you're going to have to give us something of value for him because we're holding on to him. And... He's playing pretty well right now. Mm-hmm. So it's just the fact that like Arturis Karnasovas was a widely respected talent evaluator, team building guy, finally gets his chance, puts all these eggs in this basket to build this team, largely backed on Lonzo kind of being the connective tissue of it all. And he's not there. And we don't know when he's coming back. He's potentially out for even next season, too. I'll just be. Curious to see how the Bulls can maybe t- use this momentum, whatever this momentum is. If it's just a little Pat Bev secret sauce coming in after the t- trade deadline, uh, or if it's you know the actual bedrock of Vooch and Demar and Levine, which was always going to be like the real engine of this, and Lonzo would just kind of be the table setter for every everybody. Um, I, I, I wonder where they can go. Can they band-aid this? Can they keep this thing afloat? And then Lonzo magically returns in a year, like this time around. Who's to say? But it's just, they looked so good when they, I, they were like eight and two or something to start last season. Mm-hmm. And then Lonzo, we've never really seen from him again. It just kind of, that's, that part is a sad reality of the situation. Um, I'm sure he's not having a great time, obviously, not being able to be out there. And that just sucks for him and basketball fans across the league because he was really finding a stride in New Orleans before this contract. So just a bummer overall. But I think it would be a nice little story if Chicago can salvage something out of this year. Yeah, I think the overall vibe is what what you had hoped would be a top half of the East kind of a top, you know, home court advantage type of team, which is what they looked like before the injuries kind of really set in halfway through last season. The You're not getting there. And that is a bummer. And the Lonzo component of it obviously sort of casts a pall over all of that. And then the broader question of if, you know, you're starting the, the monster Zach Levine extension and you've got, you know, DeMar only under contract through the end of next season. Vooch and unrestricted free agent after this season, kind of what is your team as you figure things out from here? 
Um, it's oh, our producer, John Gennaro, also notes Jason Richardson, uh, legend of multiple teams, including those Sixers, had cartilage uh, replacement on his, uh, his knee uh, before the end of his career. If you've got, you're starting the, the Levine contract extension, you're you know, trying to figure out how you piece together what the next pivot is. You've already got like 123 million under the cap for next season. And that's, you know, if Lonzo isn't playing, what are you going to do in the middle? All those sorts of questions. There's a big fear of like, how do we make, get back to the level we hoped this would be? But you're right. Like there's no reason to look a gift horse in the mouth. And if this turns into unexpected playoff run, chance to have, you know, DeMar, you, you feel good with DeMar going head to head with pretty much anybody down the, the stretch of a, of a tight game. You know, maybe there's a, a little bit more joy to ring out of the season for Chicago and they could certainly use some more of it. Especially being that they don't have much to fix this. They don't have much left in the cupboard. They have oh, yeah, from, the picks out the door from all the accounting uh, that I've gotten. They have refused to really entertain putting Patrick Williams in any trade. So this is going to be pretty much the group moving forward. Obviously, there can be creativity here and there and getting Alex Bruce on the mid-level, all that type of stuff. Like that, they, They've shown it in the past, but uh, their levers to pull are going to be limited, to say the least. We're going to bring this thing to a close with one last quick segment that we are calling Divine Intervention, where I ask Dan for a little fatherly advice. I'm a little skeptical today, being that this is a guy being Dan Devine, who left his headphones at like the one time he showed up to the office earlier this week and then had to post an embarrassing message to like the entire company Slack about it when it was also optional to even go into the office. So I don't know if you're really the person I want to be coming to, but I'm going to let you defend yourself really quickly before I give you the quick uh, other rant here. <laughs> cool. I love to start off new segments and new endeavors together with blatant disrespect. So here's the thing. I went to the office yesterday because um, our co-workers were trying to get together for a, a company meeting, a Yahoo staff sports meeting, Yahoo sports staff meeting rather. And um, was Jake Fisher at the office yesterday? No, I no. Had to, was, I, had, I had to write. I had oh, things no, to do. Had to write. You know what? Somebody wrote at the office. You know, if you, if, if you, if it matters to you, if you care enough to be part of the team, you show up at the office, you get set up in a side room, you go and you sit in the big boardroom, you get a half a sandwich with everybody, you go to the cocktail hour afterwards, then you come home and you walk the dog after putting the kids to bed. That's just I what left, you do. I left the meeting early to go to Brooklyn, Cleveland and report and learn and work and work the source network. I don't know what you want from me, man. Well, I, listen, I, I have a lot of respect for the way you do your job. Clearly, you don't have a lot of respect for the way I do mine. What I would say about the Leaving your headphones. Yeah, I had my headphones in while I was working. Uh, they fell out of my bag. I didn't know where they were. I didn't post an embarrassing message in the company Slack. I went into the New York City Slack channel and I said, hey, if anybody in the office found saw these earbuds, I'd appreciate it if you give me a shout because you speak to the people so the people can speak back to you. The people's insider of all people should know this. And who spoke back to me? Security. Jose, my man on floor nine, found them, got them back to me, charged them at his desk. Wow. I was waiting for him to, while he was waiting for me to come back. So nothing but respect for our teamwork, for the folks that are looking out for us that we the way we look out for each other, even if on this podcast, evidently, we don't have one another's back like that. That's disappointing to me, but me and Jose will do that next week's episode, I guess. We'll make that work together. <laughs> Listen, if you leave your headphones at my place, I will charge them for you. Well, and let's find out if I ever want to come, Nate. Jake. I mean, we'll see. We'll see if I ever want to show up. That's true. I also, you know, you said I got a ping. I got a notification. That's that's the, that's the embarrassing part to me. A lot of people got a little little vibrate in their pocket, looked at their phones. Oh, what's this? And then they learned, unbeknownst to them. You notified all of us that you left your headphones behind. I, didn't I just put thought it was like a little an at here in the channel. I just put it. All right, Jake. Listen, I'm not here to. I'm. I, I'm not here to have an engagement with you and an argument with you about what's an appropriate way to use intra-company communication. Uh, you know, software. That's something we can we can hash out with our producers who email you and wonder if you're ever going to get back to them. We can figure out That's all true. kinds of stuff That's later. True. For right now, though, I believe you are coming to me to ask me advice <laughs> on some on a problem you have, which this is a really interesting way to start doing that. Well, on our last test show, I also kind of flamed you while asking for advice. I figured I'd try it out again, and it worked well. I think it's a good, it's a really like good it. bit. It's a good bit. Well, the thing I want to ask you about is this. All right, got a bachelor party this weekend. 
Mm. When my father had his bachelor party, as he happens to tell me every week, because my parents tell me the same story every single <laughs> time I see them or talk to them on the phone, as I'm sure you will do with your children any day right. now, the, the time yeah. is coming. Um, you know, his bachelor party was a one night show in Newark, New Jersey at Four Nose of Spain, a wonderful restaurant for anyone in the area. The paella, highly recommend. Um, <laughs> like, there's just, it's out of control, I think the number of weekends that people are expected to sacrifice um, in order to celebrate a thing that is beautiful and great. But that's another weekend that I'm going to be attending as well. Am I just jaded by the bachelor party? Mm. or and, And is there a way that I can bring a better energy into this upcoming trip or do I just need to accept that there's going to be weekends and I mean, even the the weekend uh, of between game three and four of the finals, I've got a wedding I have to attend to. So I just, I'm, I, I'm, I'm wrestling with how to just comprehend and look at, the balance of of this work, this league, and a lot of routine. Um, I don't know. I don't want to say partying because that's a fun thing that everyone should always do. But um, you know, you get my point. Just ringing around the rosy, you know, joining hands and toasting couples that are going to be toasted, whether or not I'm there or not. <laughs> Jake, geez. all right, okay. Few important questions. One, where is this bachelor party? Um, it is outside Reno, Nevada, at a friend's ranch, where I've been told that we could be getting muddy. I was not told what the activity will be. Okay, but to bring clothes that could get muddy was my one and only packing requirement. Okay. Um. Who, uh. How, wh- Scale Good friend of one from college. One of my best I was going to say, I was gonna say, scale of one to five, closeness of friend. He's up there. He's, He's up, up there. there. And, okay, and I so want it's a high to number. go. I want right. to go. That's the thing. That's the thing. I'm here's here's really what it is. I want to go, but I also don't. So I don't know how to straddle that line. That's basically where it's coming from. Well, okay. Final question: Have you informed this friend that you don't really want to go to his bachelor party? No, uh, of course not. Sub question: Is this friend likely to listen to the debut episode of your new podcast? It's very on possible. Every time, literally okay. every time I've gone on SiriusXM, every time his <laughs> father has either texted him that I'm on it, mm-hmm. or left him a voicemail of me on speakerphone speaking on the radio. <laughs> And then I've been texted the audio of that voicemail. And there's been times where I've hung up the phone from Sirius XM. And then I've gotten a call from this, this groom immediately after hanging up. And he's in the car with his dad. So it is very possible that if he doesn't listen, his father, who I will say is going on the bachelor party. That's, okay. the, one, that's the one saving grace here to me. I've never done that. I've had I've had a sister of a groom be there. Um, mm-hmm. I've had you know a cousin who no one really knows, but he's like younger. And then like he kind of breaks out of his shell by the end of the weekend, and we're all you know kumbaya. Well, that sounds like a movie. That's maybe the, like the yeah, is the dad or the or the little cousin part. The little cousin who breaks out of his shell. Maybe I don't know if he's singing Paradise City or something like that by the end of it. Yeah, like that. That sounds a little bit like the plot of a film. Jake, here's what I'm hearing. This is a good friend of yours, somebody that you care deeply about, somebody whose family you have a connection to and a family that supports your work and is yes. proud of you and engaged and invested in your success in your life. Stop complaining. Go to the <laughs> damn bachelor party and have fun and support your friend like your friend supports you. Let us have let's may God send you no greater loss the needing to go to a bachelor party with your friends for the weekend. May God send you no greater loss, Jake. It's an Irish Catholic thing. My grandma and my mom said to me when they when they know I'm complaining a little too much. May God send you no greater loss. These are these are not problems that we are talking no. about. They're inconveniences, yes. if you will. 
when in your life are you going to be? Now, okay, okay, great. You know, I don't know your life like that. We're going to learn about our lives as we go through this process. When in your life are you going to go get muddy on a ranch outside Reno, Nevada for a weekend where you got no responsibilities, no problems? When, when else is that going to happen? I just want to live in a world where I can teleport and not have to fly and connect through LAX. And then we got to, you know, get a bunch of dudes in a group chat and pound out how to figure, you know, the carpool from the flights because this group's flying from here and this group's flying from there. And then I got 97 notifications when I always have 97 notifications, especially now that the unread uh, function is on iMessage, which shout out to Apple because that has been a lifesaver for me. Um, <laughs> I just don't want to be like trade deadline trying to figure out where James Wiseman's going and getting like silly little things in this group text that, you know, that's kind of, it's, it's really the group text. It's really I the hear, group text and the logistics. Once I'm I there, I'm going to have a blast. Gonna yes, have a blast. I hear that. And I'm like, listen, everybody is allowed to be frustrated by stuff like logistics. I totally understand that. Connecting flights, working out logistics of who's picking up who where. I understand that those things are frustrating. Also, but, I just learned while we were recording the friend that I'm flying with, he got upgraded to Delta One and I did not. So... Oh, maybe man, this gotta, really, maybe this is going to continue to make me seem like just a whiny, <laughs> but that sucks. I have not to know great. that whole flight that he's going to be because he's the kind. This is a not. This is not the groom, but the, this is the kind of friend that will then tell me the entire bachelor party weekend that, oh yeah, you know, if you were Delta One, blah 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 blah. So uh, that's going to be hanging over me too. It's going to be an interesting time. So you asked, the question that you asked in the sort of nestled within all this complaining was <laughs> how can you bring better energy to this experience? And I think the short answer is don't do this. What you're doing now, do it now. And that's fine. We can get it out in this safe space in the box that I'm in after you smacked me. We can get it out here. Don't bring this with you to the plane. Don't bring it with you to the connecting flight. Don't bring it with you to the to the the group chat. Don't bring it with you to the the carpool. So certainly do not bring it to the mud. You need to be getting things out of the mud, not bringing things into the mud. And when your friends need you, which when I understand your point about like they're going to be toasted whether you're there or not, but they want you there to be part of it because they love you and care about you, Jake. And that's something that we could all use more of in this chaotic and benighted time that we're all living in. So instead of complaining about how I have so many unread messages that I can't possibly, James Wiseman, oh no, go talk to the people. The people will talk back to you. Go on the airplane, get muddy. I don't even know what the hell that means, but go get muddy. I don't know. Have a time. Either. Report back on the podcast next week and don't complain about people that love you wanting to have you around and, and bring you out for, I don't know, ranch uh, activities. Well, there will come a time in your life, if you're lucky enough to, to fo follow in my footsteps and have a family like I do, where you will not be invited out for ranch activities on weekends. And even if you are, you're going to say, no, I have to go to swim class. I can't go to that. <laughs> so enjoy this time now. Grab it with both hands. Cherish it and stop complaining to me. That's great. I mean, divine intervention will just continue to be a space where I vent to you and I end up <laughs> leaving very relaxed and you're angry. That's and exactly right. And flustered and looking very Irish of the face. Uh, <laughs> but for now, I'm going to leave it with let's get toasted and thank all our listeners who either listen to us toasted or not, because this has been no cap room. And if you did, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have held it against you. Uh, this has been the Ball Don't Lie Podcast Network um, from Yahoo Sports. We want to give a special thanks to John Gennaro behind the glass, Brett Rader, and Evan Doherty for our audio and video production. You can follow us on Twitter, of course, if you are the type of person that has a Twitter. If you are the type of person that has a Twitter and are listening to the show and don't follow either of us, I would be shocked. <laughs> but I'm at Jake L. Fisher. That's at your man, Divine. Also, as we're starting this journey together, please follow the show on whichever platform you're hearing us right now. Leave a five-star review. Tell a friend. Tell an enemy. Every little bit helps grow the show. We appreciate it. We appreciate you. And we would appreciate it if you came back next time, next week, for another episode of No Cap Room. <laughs>